<laughs> We're good. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys, everyone. I'm going to start, I'm going to get started if that's okay with you. Um, and welcome to everyone who's you know here and also those of you that are watching this recorded. My name is Megan McNamee. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist um, and co-owner of Feeding Littles. And we're here, obviously, well, we're here with Judy, who just came on. This is Judy Delaware. You want to say hi, Judy? Hi, everybody. I'm Judy. I'm here in Colorado. Do you want me to tell you about myself? I don't know what, how far you guys got already. Well, let me talk about, we haven't really done anything yet. So let me just, um, I want to introduce Evelyn, obviously, the star of the hour today. Um, and then we'll probably, we'll talk just briefly about the connection here because a lot of you guys came over or came to this event because of Evelyn and knowing about intuitive eating and probably are wondering who in the world we are and why, why we're connected to this. Um, so I just wanted to mention kind of or, or, or introduce you to Evelyn for those of you that actually might not know her very well. This is Evelyn Triboli. She is a registered dietitian. I actually did not know all of the, the accolades she has on her bio until I read it. Um, I met Evelyn about 15 years ago when I was like 12. No, I was a little bit older than that. <laughs> Um, so I was only the author of 10 different books, um, including the best-selling intuitive eating, which um, many of you guys have probably read. Um, and intuitive eating has actually given rise to over 140 different studies to date. She's an international speaker. She's a trained health professional. Um, she's done tons of training for other health professionals to become certified intuitive eating counselors. And that's actually what I did training in um, back then, many years ago. Um, you also might see Evelyn busy in the media. She has been featured in the New York Times, CNN, NBC's Today Show. She's been in the um, Good Morning America as their nutrition expert for many years. Evelyn, your bio is so long. I'm just oh, don't even don't even worry about getting through summarize. it. Summarize. <laughs> She's amazing is what we're trying to say. She's amazing. Um, and just from a from so many of us on this call, I know are dietitians or have worked kind of in the nutrition sphere. And she's, she has completely changed our lives and how we practice. Um, but I just need to share this with you because this is so fascinating to me. She qualified for the Olympic trials in the first ever women's marathon in 1984. I, I don't know how that's amazing. Many of us hate running. So good for you, Evelyn. Um, <laughs> And although she no longer competes, she is a wicked ping pong player, avid hiker. And Evelyn, tell them what you're now starting to. Well, my new passion is, is surfing. <laughs> yeah. I'm wobbly, but it gives me great joy. Great joy. Yeah. Okay. So I think she could kick our butts. That's the moral of the story. Um, which is wonderful to see the, the joy that you get out of movement and exercise. We were kind of talking about that earlier. Um, so Evelyn has a new book that we're going to kind of share with you and ask a whole bunch of questions about. And if you're wondering who in the world we are, um, Judy and I are co-owners of a company called Feeding Littles. And we actually met about six years ago, seven years ago now. And um, we help parents with kids, with babies and toddlers feel confident in feeding their kids. Um, there's kind of a thread of intuitive eating woven throughout. And as I was trained, you know, in intuitive eating many years ago, it totally reshifted my practice. And when we started working with um, babies and toddlers in that age group, we realized how critical it really is to um, kind of start the intuitive eating process from the beginning, because it's really a life cycle thing. And the most intuitive eaters are children. They are born with these innate abilities to um, know when they're hungry and full and what their bodies need. And so it's such an honor to be able to share intuitive eating with a wider audience via Feeding Littles um, from the start. And what so many of our families have realized is that they have some of, you know, food issues themselves and they are healing through kind of, um, breaking those, those generational, um, cycles and helping their kids, they're healing themselves. So, um, it's very, very cool for us to be here. Uh, Judy, do you want to explain a little bit about what you do in case they're sure, of course, curious yes. what a feeding therapist is? Yeah. So um, I'm Judy Delaware. I'm here in Colorado and I'm an occupational therapist and I specialize in pediatrics with children that have um, what we call sensory processing disorder or issues. Um, I have a small private practice and work with feeding with kids, mostly the ages zero to three. So the irony in all of this is I help kids learn to love 
food and learn to eat and gain weight. So, um, and we really talk about all about how important it is to listen to your body. So I always use and reference like the movie uh, Inside Out, which is that Pixar mm-hmm. movie. And it really talks about all that interoception that kids learn about like paying attention to their little signals. So I am so excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Wonderful. Well, we told Evelyn that, I mean, we're learning a little bit about her already, but we told her we had a few icebreaker questions for her. They're not scary, but we just have a few like rapid fire. You ready? Yeah, ready. Okay. What's your favorite food? Oh my God. Chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) What's your favorite drink? (sighs) Oh, I'd have to say coffee in the morning. Oh, well, segue to the next question. How do you take your coffee? Milk. I can't drink it without milk. Actually, I've tried, and I just don't care for it. I was. That's how I was raised. So just yeah. like, just milk, just milk, and it needs to be heated up. I started doing that after I went to Brazil, and they serve your coffee with heated milk. They have a pitcher of heated milk and a pitcher of coffee. And it's like, oh, this is too good. <laughs> we like we like soul sisters. So far, all of our interests are the same. <laughs> Do you have any pets? And if so, what are their names? And um, if you don't have any pets, what what would you have if you could? Well, I had a beloved pet, Johnny. He was a little sheep who he looked like a little uh, fluffy sheep dog. And if I could right now, I would have a dog. However, I am pent up and dying to travel. So I have to get that out of my system before I have another pet. But I do love dogs very much. Yeah. Are there any animals that you're afraid of? Oh, my God. I never thought about that before. Hmm. Not that I can think of. (laughs) Judy and I both at the same time for us said snakes. Snakes. (laughs) You know what? I hike a lot. And so you just learn to respect snakes. You know, you wait for them to cross the trail. Sometimes that takes a while. So yeah. Well, yeah. hey, we're going to have to start sending you scary animal pictures and see if anything freaks you out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you already told us, but what are your favorite hobbies? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I love surfing. I love dancing and li- listening to live music, hanging out with friends. So yeah. okay, we have t- two more for you. Okay. And favorite embarrassing Netflix or streaming show obsession? Oh my gosh. Good question. I I can't even think of one right now. Honest to gosh, because I haven't been watching much TV. (laughs) Maybe that's the embarrassment part. It's been a while. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. That's fair. All right. Pass on that one. Okay. And the last question is, we know you have grandkids. So what are your, what are your two favorite books you absolutely love reading to your grandkids? Oh my God. I've got it right here. The belly button book. (laughs) Of course. The going to bed book. Oh, Um, and I'll tell you why they're right here. That's been one of the, something that happened out of the pandemic. I just started reading to them every night as they're finishing dinner. So that's why I have the books right here by my computer. Every night I read a story and it's so delightful. And as you know, my, my daughter went through your feeding littles training. So it's like, we're like this one big happy family. (laughs) (laughs) Evelyn says that. Sometimes they get on the FaceTime and they're covered in food and all messy. And we're like, there you go. There's your sensory experience for the day. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's fabulous. All right. Well, Evelyn, we know that. We're going to hop into questions. Sorry. Um, We know that you're usually the one. Go for it. (laughs) We're Evelyn. We know that you're the one who usually asks the questions, but we get to ask you the questions now today. So our first big question is, can you define it? intuitive eating uh, and explain why forming this healthy relationship with your body and food is so important, not just for yourself, but your family. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to back up just a little bit. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this together because this idea of dismantling diet culture is so huge, but to, to, to boil it down to a, a power, an empowering act that we have agency in our families, that we can end the legacy of diet culture at our kitchen tables. You know, I just think that's so profound. And when I talk to parents, it really resonates with them. So when I define intuitive eating, I do it many, many different ways. Probably the shortest and simplest is it's the self-care eating framework where you're the boss of you period. (laughs) No one can tell you what to do. You're in charge of your body. And so the cool thing about intuitive eating, when Elise Resch and I created it over 25 years ago, we can say it was research inspired. It was inspired by the uh, experiences that, that we had. But now fast forward with all the studies that have come out on it, it's just incredibly exciting. And one of the things that's not 
commonly intuitive eating, but the model was highly influenced by the work of L.L. Birch, who's uh, she's now deceased, but a, a, a leading expert in the child feeding relationship with, with, with parents, you know, and I think that's something really hopeful. <laughs> and as you as parents are watching their kids self-regulate, self-trust, I find it can be really, really healing. And so um, to answer your question, why is it so important? It's so that we can be flourishing in our lives and doing the things that are important to us and that we're here and we're present. We're not distracted in the anxiety and the worry about eating in our bodies, you know? I love it. Okay, I'm just going to have the chills the entire time that we do this because it's just, it's so good to hear you speak about this and also in the framework of kids. Um, yeah. I just, I think it is so healing for so many of us. So we talk about diet culture and I know we've mentioned it before, but could you define what diet culture is and how is it different than intuitive eating? Yeah, you know, so diet culture is really a, a system of beliefs that we're socialized into, where certain bodies are hierarchy or seen as superior than others, where foods are either demonized or, or reified. And when you start really taking a deeper dive into how did this all get to be, when you start looking at the roots of diet culture, there was a profound book by Sabrina Strings called Fearing the Black Body, the Racial Origins mm. of of fat phobia. And she did a brilliant job of intersecting the racist roots, the patriarchy and all these kinds of things. And so I say this to people who are struggling, they will often say, yeah, I wanna kick diet culture to the curb and yet they're still struggling. And so we need to look at what's your, what's your I often ask, what's your body lineage? How were bodies talked about in your family with your parents, your grandparents, aunts and uncles? And by the way, this is not to throw families under the bus or to shame them. It's to have an appreciation why this is so hard to let go. Of. We've been indoctrinated in this. And so the idea of dismantling it is daunting. It's even hijacked healthcare. It's in our healthcare policies. And that's that's a conversation probably for another day, but that's something I'm really looking into. How can we change the policies? Because when I have parents who have worries because their doctor said, or I've had uh, adults who has kids whose doctors have said very inappropriate things about their bodies, it creates shame and, and distrust. And this is something parents and if you don't have kids that we can all do and we can be empowered in our own agency and connection with our bodies no one gets to be the boss of you you know yeah. well I think I just want to add to that Evelyn you know you said that it's something that if we're parents or not I know there's probably a lot of people on this call that don't have kids now or you know, maybe we'll be future parents maybe not um, but sometimes approaching this from the perspective of kids or how you know parenting is actually kind of parenting yourself yes thank you absolutely you know, and that, that's what it is. And so sometimes when, when you read the, the 10 principles of intuitive eating, they sound straightforward. And yet, if you grew up in a dieting family, if you were put on a diet as a kid, that's a potent trust disruptor. It creates so much doubt. And so all, there's all this relearning and reconnection that needs to take place. And so no matter where you're at in the life cycle, it's a gift you give to yourself. It's a gift you give to your family. And sometimes it means having conversations about setting boundaries that, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to, in the legacy of diet culture in our family at the kitchen table, what does that mean when grandma comes in and starts talking about her diet? And I'm going to say something really, well, I, I, I respect, I, I'd like to start with respect and dignity, but sometimes I say grandma doesn't get a pass. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We can, we can have these conversations where a, a, a family member doesn't necessarily understand why you want to do what you're doing with all of this, but you can ask them to respect it. Can you respect this? Can you, we not talk about diets in front of the kids or, or disparaging bodies and those types of things? So it, it becomes a value. Yeah. Love it. Right? Yeah. Okay, next question about the book. So yeah. tell us about the book. How is it different than your original intuitive eating? And what was your, um, you know, motivation for writing it? Oh, my gosh. You know what? Thank you for asking that question. I got to tell you, I feel this is going to sound really weird. But there's like this I have this very sentimental and love attachment to the book and the process. And part of the reason is writing it during the pandemic and the social justice and having days where I wasn't able to write. And my father died during that process. And so 
I wanted something to come from my heart that was really connecting. And I, and so it's just, it's kind of raw, kind of authentic. And so what's different about this, it's bite-sized little pieces of intuitive eating every day. So it's very accessible. Um, I've had patients write down things I say and they'll, and in session, and they'll say, I wish I could just put you in my back pocket. <laughs> So that's what this kind of is. It's little, 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 hopefully words of wisdom, little, little aspirations, little practices, just to kind of get you through the day as we are, you know, going about diet culture and trying to survive our everyday lives as well. It's very bite-sized, which I think is helpful to parents. Yeah. I think to anyone who's busy and you know, I don't like my, when you were asking me about the Netflix question, part of it right now, my, my attention span and my bandwidth isn't what it used to be. And I think it's just the stress of the uncertainty, but reading small things I can do listening to, I'm doing tons of audios. I can do that. So I think it's important to honor wherever you're at, you know, and that might mean reading small amounts or, or changing the ways that you listen or, or view things. So yeah, that's it's, cool. it's, it's honoring our humanity. <laughs> and some days you just don't got it and that's okay. You know, oh, all these, all these amazing, like little sound bites. We need to record just, uh, we need to just have this all recorded, um, uh, tr- you know, transcribed because I'm literally writing as fast as I can because you have so many little uh-huh. nuggets that I love. Um, and in this book, you refer to sometimes mantras and meditations. And so for those of you that haven't gotten it yet, it, this is, we got the advanced reader's copy, which I've never gotten an advanced reader's copy of anything. Oh. So I was like, what is this? But this is what it looks like. It's so cool. And Evelyn, if I can, I'm just going to show people it, you know, there's little tiny bits. So we're talking a paragraph, sometimes just literally a a phrase. And some of them are referred to as mantras or meditations. And um, if you're new to the world of meditation, or if you don't really do any sort of meditation, you might feel intimidated by this language. I know I struggle with meditation myself um, and I'm trying to get into it more, can you expand on these terms and like how to use this book kind of yeah. with that, with that understanding? Yeah. And so, you know what, you're right. That when you hear the word meditation, it's kind of a big word. And what this is, I've had so many patients that would struggle before they sat down to eat. The anxiety would be high, fear would be high. And so all it really is, is just reading some words of, of aspiration before you sit down, whether it's gratitude about the body, whether it's gratitude about the food that you're about to eat, whether it's connecting to how the food even got onto the table. So it's not really sitting down and, and meditating in, in the classic way, but it's more of kind of getting grounded in in the process just by reading these short little phrases and the mantras are just basically pithy statements just to remind you you know you know intuitive eaters are the experts of their own body there is no pass or fail there's only learning and discovery things like that just to remind you like oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah (laughs) you know so So yeah you a little follow-up question that you gave us a few of them right now but what is your favorite one like short one Oh my favorite? God. You know what? I think probably one of them, I don't have a memorized, but something to the idea that no one can be the expert of you, you know, only you mm-hmm. know what satisfaction feels like only, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences and so on. So, and so what I would say to anyone who the people are reading this book, cause you all are in tendency here cause you got the book is I would say whatever resonates with you that feels right. Use that. And it doesn't even have to be from the mantras. It can just be from something that you read in, in, in the book. There's a phrase that, Ooh, I like that. Then, then use that one. Or like all bodies are deserving of dignity and respect. I use that one a lot. I feel so sincere about that. It's missing in, in our culture. And first we can start it with, with ourselves and then we can spread it to others. Right. Beautiful. Okay. The next one, next question is a little bit deeper here. So many of us grew up in diet culture and we watched our parents struggle with foods in their bodies. Some of us, even on this call, um, have had eating disorders. Mm. One of the most common fears our, our clients share is that they're terrified about passing on their eating issues to that next generation. Uh, What advice do you have for parents who hold this fear? You know what? That's such a great question. I get that one a lot. And I think that's how I ended up developing this aspiration of ending the legacy of diet culture in your family. Because I've seen that be really meaningful. You know, it's often taught that when you're setting goals or aspirations for yourself, it has to be just about you. And I have found that when it's about your family or about your kids or something deeply meaningful about that. And so the, the answer is, is it's possible. We also have to recognize with eating disorders specifically, there's a genetic component to that, you know? And so what we can do is we can create the conditions that hopefully this won't, won't arise. Cause I, I would 
One of the things that really just gets me is when sh- parents have so much shame about their parenting and parenting is hard. I think it's one of the most humbling things you can ever do and you do the best you can. And when you find out that what you're doing isn't so helpful, okay, you learn better, do better, those, those types of things. And that's why this idea of the kitchen table sanctuary in your family is, is so important that just this idea, all bodies are deserving of dignity and respect, including the foods that we put in them. We don't comment on bodies. We don't comment about eating. We enjoy eating. We connect through eating. Eating is a privilege. So those are some, some ways that I would, I would look at this, you know? That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. It's a uh, healing. Yeah. Furiously writing this down, Evelyn. Thank you. Um, yeah. I think that is, that is um, I think those of us who are, who have had, you know, disordered eating or kind of this cycle so ingrained in us, that is kind of our biggest goal. And I have to tell you a uh, fear of mine. When I found out I was having a, two girls, I have two girls. That is the first thing I thought of. I didn't want to have girls because I was terrified I would pass on my eating issues. Mm, to them. Mm. Isn't that like the, that's the first thing that came to my mind? Well, you know, it's it's the culture that we're living in. So I would say it's it's understandable. I have also worked with patients struggling with eating disorders who have fears of becoming pregnant because of all what that means in terms of the cultural expectations and, and, and entitlement. But with awareness, we can make meaningful change, you know, and so that we can say, how can I do this differently? You know, and it's possible to do things differently. And, you know, one of the things I don't recall if I self-disclose this in the book, but I grew up with a dieting mom. And I will never forget, I was really lucky she didn't project it onto us, but boy, I knew her goal weight and the foods that she could eat. And so imagine fast forward at the age of 64, she gets official diagnosis of ovarian cancer, which is a terminal diagnosis from when she got it. And she stood up, surveyed her body and said to me, is one of the biggest regrets she's ever had that all the time she wasted dieting. She just wanted to grow old you know, and I can talk about it now because it's been, it's been since 2007 when she, when she died, but it's something that, that chokes me up when I start thinking about it. And, you know, intuitive eating had already been, you know, published in 1995, but it just gives me this, this deeper passion that this is unnecessary suffering. We deserve to flourish and to live and to connect and whatever good you want to be doing in the world to have the energy to doing those things that fill you up as opposed to to, you know, figuring out how to, how to shrink your body. And then when you start looking at the body of research on how it doesn't work and causes harm, that's what really gets me causes harm. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we want to stop that, that legacy and protect our, our kids and our families to the degree that we can, you know? Thank you. I'm yeah. trying to not get emotional about it. Just hearing you talk. Um, some of, we kind of already alluded to this, but I'm wondering if we can give some tangible, some, some more tangible um, options for, for those that are caregivers, parents, or even just around younger people here. Um, some of the hardest thing with this is convincing our parents and laws, other family members, that this is how we want to approach food in our homes. And you had kind of talked about how sometimes it's a major boundary setting issue. Yeah. Um, how can we talk to our loved ones in a way, like what language do you recommend using when we're saying this is how we want to approach food and bodies? Yeah. How can we not sound judgmental to them? You know what? Here, I, would, I would come from the place from I statements. And by the way, there's tons of examples in there because it's what I found with my patients. They don't know the language to use. They have yes. this fear they're going to hurt their parents' feelings. Yes. Um, or, gosh, I love my parents. I can't say this. And what I look at is, you know what? I hear the love you have for your children. I hear the harm that this has caused you. And this is about protecting yourself. And so one of the techniques I I suggest is having a proactive conversation, not when someone just made a comment and you're all like, "Eh, it worked up, but saying something like, you know, especially if you've had your own struggles with dieting or or an eating Mm -hmm. disorder, like, Hey mom, you know, I I love how much you've supported me and you fill in the blank with whatever that support is. It's true. Only true stuff. want to be authentic, but you know, I've really struggled. I don't want to pass this struggle onto my kids. And I'd really like you to help me. I'd like your support. Can you support me? And when they say yes, usually it's not always, but usually when they say yes, here's what the support would look like. I would love for you to not make any comments about your body, my body, the kids' bodies, celebrities' bodies, anyone's bodies. I would love it if you don't make any comments around eating and judging it good, bad calories, macros. Is that something you'd be willing to do? 
I find in the majority of cases, but not always, the answer is yes. And this is the, one of the most important parts. It's not just setting this loving boundary. It's, it's also saying what you're going to do to maintain it. And that is, oh, thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. This means so much to me. Um, and if you, if you forget, how can I politely remind you? And one of the things I suggest, it's so easy because it's in our own languaging of everyday body language. It might be something like, what if I say, oh, oh, oh we're not going to go there. Remember? Oh, remember, we're not going to go there. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, my bad, my bad. And so in a way, I likened it to like when we're training our, our puppies, you know, <laughs> we, we expect them to make mistakes. If parents have been in the habit of making all these comments, they're going to mess up and we can just remind them and they can go, ah, and if we do this in this conversation, it doesn't become a big deal. It doesn't become a big deal. So that's the way. And so it's having the conversation of setting the loving boundaries and consistently reinforcing it. Reinfor and including, you don't, it's okay if you don't agree with me. I'm just asking you to respect it. It's how I want to raise my family. Just that's like that. So, so powerful. Isn't that, it? Oh so my God, I got, I'm giving myself chills. That happens sometimes. <laughs> I love, I love when you can give yourself chills. That's great. <laughs> well, it's it, it happens when I when something is very meaningful and deep to me. Do you know? It's just it. Here's the other thing I've seen so many times in my sessions. I will ask, "Does your grandparents or do your parents know how this impacts you? How this makes you feel?" No. And so I say, you know, if they have no idea, then how do you expect them to change? How about giving them the opportunity? They can say, no, they have that option. And then we talked to boundary setting number two. <laughs> and that is what you're going to do if they, they choose not to. You're going to leave the conversation. You're going to leave the table with no drama. You're just not expose yourself or your kids to the toxicity. With no, when you can do that with no drama, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful, you know, that you have a right to do that, you know. And, and create a new legacy for your children as well. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's powerful. It is so powerful. And our, our culture right now is so, so toxic. We have enough to worry about. We, we don't need to be having this, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Next question. Okay, part of intuitive eating is all about uh, normalizing body diversity. Can yeah. Can you tell us what that means? Why it's so important? Yeah, you know, that, that bodies come in all different shapes and sizes. They've existed in all shapes and sizes. When you look at all these archaeological digs of statues and things coming out, and the moment we start pathologizing bodies, we're saying to that person, you are wrong. Your body is wrong. And I'll tell you, it breaks my heart. Some of the stories I, I've heard from families and, and, and or adults who were as kids. And so one of the analogies I like to use is is puppies. You know, there's a really funny dog I watch on TikTok. I forget the name, but it's an Italian greyhound that's into fashion and it's teeny, but that's their genetic disposition versus some of these big dogs. I see, I really do love dogs. <laughs> You know, some of these bulldogs I follow, they're massive. That's, that's what their bodies are. Bodies come in different size and shapes, just like that. No, no right or wrong. And that we, that we regard our humanity. We have unconditional regard for the, our humanity, you know? Yeah. That's great. Did Megan freeze? Megan, are you? <gasps> she did. That's why the look on her face hasn't changed. <laughs> I know. I'm looking at Megan's face. We don't know what just happened. Okay. You know what? Megan. I, okay. Uh oh, oh she's going to come back in. So she, it's you in. and me. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to jump. Oh, Megan, can you hear us? Oh, she's back. Oh, she, she's muted. How about, how about while we're getting her, her back well, out? She's in. Right I, I did want to ask another, sorry. I don't yeah. know. All of a sudden my zoom thing just came on. Like you're done. Um, <laughs> I stunned her. It's like, oh my God. I was like, I need to. I know. I kept looking at your face going there. You okay? <laughs> I'm listening very closely. Yeah. Um, I, I, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Of course. The, the, every time we talk about this in Feeding Littles, we always get the, but health. Yes. Oh, thank you for asking that question. I even have a slide in one of the, when I train health professionals that I can go through all the data and that question will still happen. So there's a big, big body of research that shows contrary to popular opinion, popular belief that size and health 
are not the same thing. And then when we talk about health, we have to remember our mental health. I'll tell you something really sad as an example. A study just came out of, of the UK looking at 22,000 teenagers over a 30 year period. And what they found, the teenagers are dieting more and it's linking up with depression. The problem and the challenge with all these studies that come out linking body size and health is they're mainly, they're association studies, which is not causation. And they don't include really important things like social determinants of health, like where you live, race, access to grocery stores. They don't include trauma, childhood trauma. ACEs are really profound uh, with linking with, with chronic diseases and, and so on. So that, that's one aspect. Secondly, there's a body of research that shows that intentional trying to lose weight through manipulating your diet and or movement, not only does it not work, it's one of the most predictive ways of gaining weight. It has the opposite impact. And I try and be careful when I say that because I don't want to reinforce weight stigma or fat phobia. But if this was a medication, there was no way that doctors would prescribe something that has a 95% failure rate, and that's going to cause harm. And the other harm, uh, inflammation, increased risk of eating disorders, more body loathing, weight stigma, fat phobia, and so on. It's, it's really, really problematic. And body size, weight is not a behavior. Weight is not a behavior. So if you're concerned about health, that's fine, but it's not a moral obligation. And let's look at things that we can do that are sustainable and that feel good, you know, moving in ways that feel good if you choose to do so, getting enough sleep, those, those types of things. And, you know, I'm going to share this. It's something that really got me. Um, what we're starting to see is medical fat phobia. There is this person, it's on TikTok, it's documented throughout. This woman, she, a young adult, was having pain, feeling like she was dying every time she's going to the bathroom. Finally got to see a gastroenterologist. She was telling the doctor, you know, when I, I can't even eat, there's so much pain. And he gave a fat phobic remark. And he said, well, that's probably a pretty a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And didn't do a medical evaluation, right? I love your eye reactions. So she shows this powerful scene where she's crying because she was completely minimized, was not worked up. And she, because of TikTok, she rallied and got a second opinion. She also got a correct diagnosis, a correct medical evaluation and diagnosis, colon cancer. She had colon cancer. So that's the problem when we focus on body size. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. And so we need to move away from that. It's, it's shaming and it's stigmatizing and that, that, yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah. That's the reason why all bodies are deserving of dignity and respect and access to health care, access to public spaces and so on. You know, thank you. So oh, say yeah. I'm brand new to this. Where is a good place to start in becoming a more intuitive eater and what's something I can do with my kids? Right. What's a tangible thing I can start with, you know, today? Oh my gosh. So, you know, one of the things I love to do, it's so funny, so people often like to start in order, but with the principles, I like to start with aiming for satisfaction because it's tangible and it's so personal. I don't know what, I don't know what satisfaction feels like to you. I don't know what food sounds good. I don't know what foods are going to feel good in your body. That's the second part of it too. And so it's very, very personal. What sounds good, what's going to feel good. And then you, and then you, and then you see. Now, the cool thing is when you're doing this with your kids, it's beautiful. In fact, you know what, for those of you that haven't watched Feeding Littles on Instagram, especially in their story, Stories where they share all these kids eat, doing almost everything but eating. They are eating, but food all over their face. And, and Judy acts it out <laughs> sometimes in their videos as, as well. It's absolutely delightful when you see these kids being able to self-regulate. So I would say for those going even through your program through baby led weaning and so on, you're seeing what happens when we when we touch in. So it takes takes listening listening to your body. And right now we're also in very exhausting times. And one of the things I like to stress with this is letting go of perfection. Sometimes making a meal is the best you can do is push the microwave button. There's no shame in that. Sometimes making the meal is calling or, or, or using your app for <laughs> Uber Eats or something like that, leftovers or, or whatnot. It's okay to honor your energy level. Sometimes eating is just ordinary. It doesn't have to be divine. So when I talk about satisfaction, people think it has to be like this 10. And by the way, I love those experiences, but they don't have to be that way. You know, I'm writing that down. Sometimes eating is just ordinary. It doesn't have to be divine. Thank you. Yeah. 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 We call them, um, I can't even meals. Oh, <laughs> I like, like that. I can't even I, like, here you go. You're gonna have some crackers and cheese. Good luck to you. Have a, have a nice dinner. 
Yeah. So it's, it's respecting your, your, your energy level and where you're at. You know, you can't be all things to all people at all times. And, and with parenting, it's, 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 boy, I tell you, it's humbling. <laughs> like I said earlier. Yeah. You, you oh, know, one thing we, oh, sorry. I was just going to add Judy. One thing we find all the time is it, it's almost like we have, it, it's weird when, when you tell people you're a dietitian or you're in the food world, they make assumptions about what your, your dogma is. And I feel that I almost, and a lot of, I know a lot of dietitians on here, I'd agree with this. I feel like I have to defend food. I have to defend <laughs> eating. You know what? It, that's a, such a good point. And in fact, here's what I like to say on the making peace with food is you don't have to explain your eating. You don't have to explain why you're eating the salad or the donuts. Do you know? I, I, I tell you a funny little story. This just happened to me uh, last week. I got a, a, a very nice DM from a cookbook author who wanted to send me a book awesome. And part of the subtitle, it had healthy. And in her note to me, she's explaining, I mean, the good kind, not the, it's like a, wow, look at diet culture that we're over explaining ourselves. So I say diet culture doesn't get to get vegetables, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. So when you get connected to your own truth, then there's no explanation needed. It's because it feels good for me, you know? Yeah. You know, just if I can add one thing, I re-listened to uh, the Dan Harris uh, podcast that you did about the anti-diet. And the one line that really, really stuck with me was when you said, where does your mind go when you're eating? Yeah. And, and, and it, we are so connected to so many things. And, and I see with parents that letting go of that and just being, cause they're like, well, what should I talk about with my kid? And I'm like, I don't know. We just had a big snowstorm. Talk about the snow, but there were only two. It's like, well, that's okay. You know, <laughs> find a way to, to, to connect with your, with your child. And I think, you know, allowing the, like if we were allowed to go have lunch together, would we talk about what's on your plate? Unless, oh. unless, I, unless I was eating off your plate. Like I, Sometimes, well, I used to, <laughs> to taste it. but anyway, but I think that was just such a profound thing of where do you allow your mind to go when you're eating? And yeah, that's just, it's gold. It's just absolutely gold. Thank you. Thank you. And so, you know what, you're right. It's a part of it too. Some people have this uh, fear that to do intuitive eating, you've got like to light a candle and be a monk and do all these. It's like, no, sometimes the best you can do is eating while you're driving and picking up your kid from, from somewhere. That's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It can be helpful. It's very nuanced. Where does your mind go? And the reason I asked him that is because he's a, he's a meditator. I had a feeling he, he would <laughs> be curious about that as well. But from a practical standpoint, when you're in relationship, when you're eating, oh, let's, let's use this. Oh my God. So, you know, we're getting kind of hopeful with the pandemic stuff, more vaccines out, things are opening up. The idea of getting together with family and friends, I would hate for you to be preoccupied with what to eat, not what to eat. I'd want to be connected and rejoicing and seeing people you haven't seen in a year uh, mm-hmm. and enjoying that meal, enjoying the sense or whatever it is that you are doing to connect with the people that you are breaking bread with is is a gift, right? Let's all keep that one in our back pockets around the corner. Okay. Our next question. I know we we still have a little time, I think. Um, Many of us are perfectionists and we're we're used to following rules, but intuitive eating, eating is not about on again, off again, like a diet. What are some tips to give ourselves some compassion along this journey? Oh, you know what? That is such a good question. And it's one of the biggest obstacles I find, you know, so what happens when people are used to following the rules of diet culture and outsourcing your eating decisions to some influence or some diet book, you do it at the expense of self-connection. And as a result, um, it's like you're learning how to walk all over again. I've had people say, I can tell you the macros, the calories in a single P, but I don't know how to F and eat anymore. And so I will say, how often have you connected with your body from the inside? And usually the answer is not very often. And I'll say, well, just like when your kid is learning how to walk, they're going to fall, they're going to bumble around. And we don't say, you idiot, get up. That sounds awful because I'm saying it right now. How would you talk to a dear one, to a child, to a friend, to your, to your, if, you have, if you have pets, to your pet? And that's a way I find many times 
people can say beautiful words towards others and where the real practice is now let's start shifting that attention towards yourself mm -hmm. toward yourself i'm just learning so here's oh, oh here's here's one um <laughs> I love this. It has to do with mindset, the growth mindset. And it has to do with a little tiny word yet. So we're going to do a little practice right now if you want to. I invite people. You don't have to do this. And I won't know if you're not anyway. So because it's, a, it's a kind of a mind thing to say to yourself, I'm not an intuitive eater. See how that lands. I'm not an intuitive eater and you want to be. Or I'm not an intuitive eater yet. I'm not an intuitive eater yet. See the difference in that? So whatever it is that you're, you're frustrated about, maybe you're not connecting so much with your body. I'm not connecting with my body yet, meaning you're on your way. It's, it's, it's not about perfection. What, what did you learn from this experience? So there's many, many ways. And I find it's one of the hugest uh, stumbling blocks for most people that I work with is they're so harsh on themselves. And then that doesn't feel good. You know, it adds more suffering. Well, and the people that are most likely to be dieters or are type A anyway, you I know, mean, we have so many personality types that kind of fall in line with that rigid, rigid thinking and they yeah. want the rules and they want the, and, and I've seen people kind of fall into the trap of almost using intuitive eating as a diet. Well, that's a really good point. And so when you've come from diet culture, it's easy to accidentally turn intuitive eating into rules. They're not rules. They're 10 principles. They're guideposts. And you get to decide. Or here's, here's one thing to really look at is um, let's give yourself the opportunity to see what your body does. So let's say for hypothetical, uh, hypothetical purposes, you ate lunch and it was so much food that you feel physically uncomfortable. So we can say you ate past fullness. Rather than panicking and trying to micromanage the rest of your day, which a lot of my patients do, let's see what your body naturally wants to do. Do you get, did you get hungry in the afternoon like you normally do around four? Maybe when it comes time for dinner, uh, your appetite level is gonna be different, but you rob yourself of watching your body's ability to adjust when you mm -hmm. keep rushing in to micromanage the, the panic. And then that creates more disruption and trust. You know, <sighs> right? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. No, I'm. <laughs> it's hard for me to not get like a little teary because I, like I said, this was so life changing for me, and yeah, it because it does it heals so much for you about yourself, and kind of lets you understand the framework for what you grew up in. Yeah, yeah. And then understanding how we could do it better. It's and it, it doesn't. You know, people. I think it's so overwhelmed sometimes. With those tips that you gave, you know, just avoid talking about bodies. That's one thing yeah. we can do. We can just, we can stop talking about bodies, other people's bodies. That's one easy thing that parents can do. Yeah. And, you know, as you're saying this, what comes up for me too, you know, because you hear people saying how this is life changing. You've said that. Oh. And, and I think part of the reason why it is, is you're not only healing your relationship with food, mind, and body, but you're cultivating that sense of trust. It grounds you. And then that trust, you, you know, spills over into other areas of life, other decisions that you are making. And then you have more brain space also to, yeah. to work on other things if you choose to, or, or to do nothing and to enjoy relaxing, you know? Well, and, and there's a thing that goes around all the, on, you know, social media about, you know, we want our kids to trust their fullness and hunger yeah. because we want them to know when their body's giving them signals, they listen to those signals that applies to not just food. Yes. It applies to icky people and, you know, um, tricky people. It applies to that feeling of something's wrong, yes. you know, something wrong here. Mm -hmm. Um, or I, you know, um, I'm tired. I'm, you know, all the different signals that our bodies give us. Exactly. It's, it's, you're reinforcing that every single day when you're, when you have that trust. You're reinforcing that and you're getting your agency back. And if we look at dieting or eating disorders as a form of trauma, because on a cellular level, your body thinks, oh my God, she's killing me. He's killing me. You know, I'm not getting enough to eat. And so when you diet, it just creates that. But when we keep remembering our agency, I am in charge. I got this. I can figure this out. Then that also applies in other areas in life. It's part of the healing, part of the healing. Yeah. Love it. It's so good. We probably should start asking some or answering oh, some questions. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, we, I don't see a ton of them on the, the chat yet, but we, we didn't invite them yet. Maybe that's yes. why. Yes. We would like to open it up. If you have any questions, is that right, Jen? Is that the best thing to do for them to write it in the chat box or is it? Yeah. The chats, um, there's a little Q and a function at the bottom, but there, the okay. chat has been pretty easy to follow. So please feel free to submit questions there or, you know, leave more comments. 
Yeah. Or if it turns out you're speechless, <laughs> that's okay too. There's no pressure. This is kind of a, a time of celebration and um, we don't have to get down in deep and answer questions. If, if, if they're not on your mind, I, I would consider, wow, we did a good job. <laughs> Or sometimes this stuff opens things up that are kind of deep that you don't want to discuss. You're just kind of taking that in. So it's, it's all good, you know? Oh, I think we have one. Okay. Okay. This is so good. Ooh. Would you feel, okay. So when we, when you we were talking about the principles, there are 10 principles and mm-hmm. the book. Um, and I, I, I saw your note, Jen, that I guess this copy doesn't have the pretty colored picture. <gasps> inside, so this one does here. Yeah, show us, show us. Ooh, look at this. Look at that. And look oh at this, gosh. this French flap thing. I love because it's a placeholder. On yes. Both sides. Oh, so, yeah. You guys Thank are all going to get that. So the book actually goes through the principles of intuitive eating, but it kind of breaks them down and dividing it into the 365 days. And when Evelyn had mentioned one principle to start with is satisfaction. This question is, would you still start with satisfaction if you know you are extremely connected, disconnected? Uh, you know, that's a really good, good question. And so what I say with all of these is we, we need to meet you where you're at. And so if you're feeling incredibly disconnected or dysregulated with your eating sometime, and this is actually in the book too, we can go toward what we call nourishment as self-care. So let's say hunger cues are offline. And by the way, stress can do that. Stress, hard day, uncertainty, pandemic, maybe they're just not there. And so we do nourishment as self-care because we are living sentient beings, we need nourishment. And so what I'd have you start looking at is eating in a way that sustains you and matches your your energy level and looking at where that is. I have worked with a lot of people who are disconnected and yet one of the ways they can access hunger is through their edgy there's an edge in terms of a, a mood shift. And I love the term hangry. And so that might be a clue that, okay, if I get to that hangry point, that means this amount of time is probably too long for me, or I didn't eat enough food to sustain me. So those are the ways we can start kind of reverse engineering it to see what, what, what that is. So thank you for that question. And, and, and that's the one thing I'd have you all keep in mind is we have to keep in mind your particular set of circumstances and it's completely fine, completely fine. I think finding satisfaction is such a journey for people. You know what it is. And actually, as you say that, we, we, we didn't talk about a nuance. And that is some people have a fear that if I enjoy my eating because enjoyment and pleasure is part of satisfaction, that there's something wrong with that. Or if I enjoy my eating, I'm not going to ever stop eating. And it's actually quite the opposite. When you can enjoy your eating and eat in a way that's satisfying, it's like, ah, I'm done and I'm con- there's a contentment that comes with it. You know, it's a, it's a pleasantness and, and this might all be new thinking for you. And that's, that's okay. We live in a culture that really does a lot of uh, fear mongering, you know, so we can start first with some basics and that is, well, what's going to sustain my body. What's going to help me get through the day. We can start there. Yeah. Judy, do you see, do you want to do the next one? Do you see oh, it? I see it. I see it too. Oh, you see it. I can ask yeah. it. Okay. Um, can, can you speak to how to integrate intuitive eating as a dietitian in a long-term care setting or any setting where the medical team is not educated on health at every size or harms of dieting? Yeah. You know, you're, you're pointing out to a really good issue, Megan, and that is the fact that diet culture is in our policies, our healthcare policies, and in spite of the data not being good behind it. So what I'd like to do when I'm having conversations with healthcare practitioners, I start first with their humanity. And that is, you know, what we have in common, we really want to help our patients survive, thrive, whatever the situation happens to be. And this person is really struggling. And there's another way that we can can work. It's called intuitive eating and explaining what it is. Um, I tend to speak in in short, let me put it this way. People right now are so stretched for time. I like to respect that. And what what I say is, because this is such a different way of thinking that people haven't been exposed to the research that I'd be happy to send you some research or, or, or short summaries on this just to help break it down. Because the other thing I've seen is a phenomenon, I'm starting to teach it this way now too, that most health professionals I train go through a point of cognitive dissonance. I don't know what it was like for you, mm-hmm. Megan, before you embraced intuitive eating, but most people, yeah, it's like this. And so my question is to think, how long did it take for you to embrace this idea, to actually look at the research, 
research. And actually, even people look at the research, they're still, and they feel conflicted. And they're in this place of cognitive dissonance. That's normal because it's a belief system that we were indoctrinated in. So it, it, it's this big unlearning that happens. So I'd be looking at um, giving our colleagues some grace in this as well, because we can't shame people. And by the way, I'm not reading that at all into your question, but it's a good, good reminder. We can't shame people into making changes. We can't shame our colleagues and like, oh my God, what are you doing? You're, you know, we need, we need to point them in the direction that you care. I can see you really care about your patients. Everything we know about weight-centric health is actually problematic. There's a bunch of data on there. I just gave you that case about that, that patient uh, having colon cancer that got mis... Actually, I can't even say misdiagnosed because the doctor didn't even do a proper medical evaluation. That's what I'd be looking at and looking at all the stigma and stuff that's coming up. So that's that's what happens when you're on the, the front line of this. You know, when you're in the, the cutting edge realm, we're doing a lot of education. So just know that's part of the process. I'd be, I would be looking at having more of those conversations. I hope that, I hope that helps. Awesome. Yeah. Judy, do you want to do that? I think the one from Laura, I think she had asked one in the chat. I don't know, Judy, do you see that one? Hmm. Ah, Laura. Okay. Um, what do you do for self-care when you feel overwhelmed by diet culture in, uh, in your role as a non-dietitian or non oh. excuse me, non-diet dietitian? Laura, that's a really good question. So one of the things I feel really strongly about is, first of all, where is your community? Where do you go for support? Mm -hmm. So and when I say that, there are communities on Facebook. There's a health at every size community for people that take our training and get certified. We have a closed group for that. But I'd be looking at that. Um, also looking in terms of where you do work, who are your like-minded healthcare practitioners? Because it can get really overwhelming and it's good to have other people that you can talk to. And self-care is really important. And you know, this is where I'm going to invoke uh, Desiree Attaway. She's in, in the book as well. And that is, you know, when you're putting yourself out there, I, I'm, I'm constantly being considerate of my own energy level. And that is, is this person reachable, teachable, and ready? If it's a healthcare provider and they have an interest, yeah, I'm going to spend as much time as it takes to help someone see that these, these perspectives. If it's a troll on the internet, I'm not going to get down into the mud and engage because I want to be in here for the long haul. And Laura, I want you to be in here for the long haul, which means we're not going to fight every fight. We got to pick and choose where we're going to put our energy. And sometimes we just don't have the energy. We don't have the energy. You know, so that's, that's a very good question. Important question. I think we have time for at least one more. There's a great okay. one here. Um, what is the best way to deal with a deep, constant fear of weight gain to be able to truly embrace intuitive eating? Ooh, yeah, that's that's deep. So th this is going to happen on many, many layers. And so when that fear is happening, keep in mind, part of that is our cultural social socialization that I was talking about earlier. Um, and, and that is, you know, looking at the role of, of, of fat phobia in, in our culture. If you've been somebody who has been on lots and lots of diets, in other words, weight suppression, the longer you hold on to attaching yourself to a certain weight, it's going to prolong the, the, the healing in this, in this process. There's always one foot in the, what is my, my weight? And so my question is, is what do you need in order to let go of the idea that your weight needs to be a certain number. What do you need in order for that to happen? And I wish I could give you the magic words and just say, ah, just don't worry about it. <laughs> you know? it it's a cultural belief system that's been around for hundreds of years, which is why it takes a while. So we need to look at that and look at what you need in order to support yourself. And your fear, unfortunately, is, is really common. Regardless of the size of your body, that is the consequence of fat phobia. When people are living in marginalized bodies and bigger bodies, they're asking, how can I be safe? When I go out into the world, when I eat food, I get ridiculed. I don't fit into the seats at the, at the theater and, mm -hmm. and so on, And which is why we need to start changing the systems and the policies. If people weren't treated so badly, the fear wouldn't be as big as it is, is my I believe. Yeah. You're, you're, you're incredible. You're oh. inspiring to us all. And I know we're almost out of time. Do, do we have any more questions, Megan? Do you see anything else there? I don't see any other ones. I'm sure that this will kind of inspire some thought for so many of you. Um, so Evelyn, obviously they're 
going to be hopefully reading your book. Um, do you, you know, do you want to direct them towards any additional resources? Yeah, you know what? I, d- I did a, a 10 day series on Instagram that started on January 4th and ran through January 14th of this year, 2021. And there is a whole series, including videos. I've got, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback and it's free. So you might want to take a look at that because there's a lot of comments and questions. I, I did a lot of uh, answering of, of, of the questions comments that are there that might be helpful too there's our also our intuitive eating online community it's free it's peer-to-peer support you can access it through the intuitive eating.org uh, website so hopefully that that helps evelyn if anybody wasn't able to see this today how would they be able to see this recording they're going to get it emailed for those who have filled out the form they're going to get a link to the recording and if they didn't fill out an email is there any way to get it um, I, Jen would have to answer that question. Jen is from my, from my publisher from Chronicle Prism. I don't know if she's on right now to answer that question. <laughs> I, I that's, feel a, like- that's actually a good question because to get this out more to more people to view it, right? right. You know what? Here's what I'm going to do on my end. I'm going to have a conversation with my publisher and see if maybe we can just release it for the, for the public, you know? We'd be amenable. I feel like the voice of the wizard without my video on talking, but yes, we can, we can work on making it available wider. <laughs> yeah. I, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I kind of, I like that idea. You know, I like that idea very, very much. So yeah, yeah. that would be awesome. Good idea, thank Judy. You. Yeah. Well, and thank you so much for um, your time with, with us today and allowing us to ask you all of these different questions and kind of dig a little bit deeper into this. Well, this thank you. I, I appreciate you taking out the time to host honor. this. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. This is how we change the world. You know, these kind of conversations. Don't ever forget, we all have influence in our relationships that we have. They can start at the kitchen table. They can start at wherever you, where your place of work is, or wherever you socialize. It can be, I don't think those jokes are funny. I don't think disparaging body size is, is funny. You know, stuff like that stuff like that. Yeah. Start small. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, this is amazing. And thank you all for, for attending and for being here. Um, we hopefully we'll see you. Obviously Evelyn shared where to find her. She, she's got some great stuff over on Instagram. We all, we are, um, on Instagram at feeding littles. Um, and we have, we always try to keep this kind of thread throughout our conversation as well. So, um, thank you all. And we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you.